Good evening. Welcome to tonight's reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars, the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm Finn J.D. John of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, and I will be your reader. Chapter 22 I Find Deja the major domo to whom I reported had been given instructions to station me near the person of the Jeddak, who in time of war is always in great danger of assassination, as the rule that all is fair in war seems to constitute the entire ethics of Martian conflict. He therefore escorted me immediately to the apartment in which Than Kosis then was. The ruler was engaged in conversation with his son, Saab Thon, and several courtiers of his household and did not perceive my entrance. The walls of the apartment were completely hung with splendid tapestries which hid any windows or doors which may have pierced them. The room was lighted by imprisoned rays of sunshine held between the ceiling proper and what appeared to be a ground glass false ceiling a few inches below. My guide drew aside one of the tapestries, disclosing a passage which encircled the room between the hangings and the walls of the chamber. Within this passage I was to remain, he said, so long as Than Kosas was in the apartment. When he left I was to follow. My only duty was to guard the ruler and keep out of sight as much as possible. I would be relieved after a period of four hours. The major domo then left me. The tapestries were of a strange weaving which gave the appearance of heavy solidity from one side, but from my hiding place I could perceive all that took place within the room as readily as though there had been no curtain intervening. Scarcely had I gained my post than the tapestry at the opposite end of the chamber separated and four soldiers of the guard entered, surrounding a female figure. As they approached Than Kosas, the soldiers fell to either side and there, standing before the Jeddak and not ten feet from me her beautiful face radiant with smiles, was Deja Thoris. Saab Thon, Prince of Zodanga, advanced to meet her, and hand in hand they approached close to the Jeddak. Then Kosis looked up in surprise and, rising, saluted her. To what strange freak do I owe this visit from the Princess of Helium, who two days ago, with rare consideration for my pride, assured me that she would prefer Tal Hajus, the Green Thark, to my son? Deja Thoris only smiled the more, and with the roguish dimples playing at the corners of her mouth, she made answer. From the beginning of time upon Barsoom, it has been the prerogative of woman to change her mind as she listed, and to dissemble in matters concerning her heart. That you will forgive, Than Kosis, as has your son. Two days ago I was not sure of his love for me, but now I am, and I have come to beg of you to forget my rash words and to accept the assurances of the Princess of Helium, and that when the time comes she will wed Saab Thon, Prince of Zodanga. I am glad that you have so decided, replied Than Kosis. It is far from my desire to push war further against the people of Helium, and your promise shall be recorded and a proclamation to my people issued forthwith. It were better, Than Kosis, interrupted Deja Thoris, that the proclamation wait the ending of this war. It would look strange indeed to my people and to yours were the Princess of Helium to give herself to her country's enemy in the midst of hostilities. Cannot the war be ended at once? spoke Saab Than. It requires but the word of Than Kosis to bring peace. Say it, my father, say the word that will hasten my happiness and end this unpopular strife. We shall see, replied Than Kosis, how the people of Helium take to peace. I shall at least offer it to them. Deja Thoris, after a few words, turned and left the apartment, still followed by her guards. Thus was the edifice of my brief dream of happiness dashed, broken to the ground of reality. The woman for whom I had offered my life, from whose lips I had so recently heard a declaration of love for me, had lightly forgotten my very existence, and smilingly given herself to the son of her people's most hated enemy. Although I had heard it with my own ears, I could not believe it. I must search out her apartments and force her to repeat the cruel truth to me alone before I would be convinced, and so I deserted my post and hastened through the passage behind the tapestries toward the door by which she had left the chamber. Slipping quietly through this opening, I discovered a maze of winding corridors branching and turning in every direction. Running rapidly down first one and then another of them, I became soon hopelessly lost and was standing panting against a sidewall when I heard voices near me. 
Apparently they were coming from the opposite side of the partition, against which I leaned, and presently I made out the tones of Deja Thoris. I could not understand the words, but I knew that I could not possibly be mistaken in the voice. Moving on a few steps, I discovered another passageway, at the end of which lay a door. Walking boldly forward, I pushed into the room, only to find myself in a small antechamber, in which were the four guards who had accompanied her. One of them instantly arose and accosted me, asking the nature of my business. I am from Thonkosis, I replied, and wish to speak privately with Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium. And your order? asked the fellow. I did not know what he meant, but replied that I was a member of the guard, and without waiting for a reply from him, I strode toward the opposite door of the antechamber, behind which I could hear Dejah Thoris conversing. But my entrance was not to be so easily accomplished. The guardsman stepped before me, saying, No one comes from Thancosis without carrying an order or the password. You must give me one or the other before you may pass. The only things I require, my friend, to enter where I will hangs at my side, I answered, tapping my long sword. Will you let me pass in peace or no? For reply, he whipped out his own sword, calling to the others to join him, and thus the four stood with drawn weapons barring my further progress. You were not here by the order of Thancosis, cried the one who had first addressed me. And not only shall you not enter the apartments of the Princess of Helium, but you shall go back to Thancosis under guard to explain this unwarranted temerity. Throw down your sword. You cannot hope to overcome four of us, he added with a grim smile. My reply was a quick thrust, which left me but three antagonists, and I can assure you that they were worthy of my mettle. They had me backed against the wall in no time, fighting for my life. Slowly I worked my way to a corner of the room where I could force them to come at me only one at a time, and thus we fought upwards of twenty minutes, the clanging of steel on steel producing a veritable bedlam in the little room. The noise had brought Dejah Thoris to the door of her apartment, and there she stood throughout the conflict with Sola at her back, peering over her shoulder. Her face was set and emotionless, and I knew that she did not recognize me, nor did Sola. Finally a lucky cut brought down a second guardsman, and then with only two opposing me I changed my tactics and rushed them down after the fashion of my fighting that had won me many a victory. The third fell within ten seconds after the second, and the last lay dead upon the bloody floor a few minutes later. They were brave men and noble fighters, and it grieved me that I had been forced to kill them, but I would willingly have depopulated all of Barsoom could I have reached the side of my Dejah Thoris in no other way. Sheathing my bloody blade, I advanced toward my Martian princess, who stood mutely gazing at me without sign of recognition. Who are you, Zodankan? she whispered. Another enemy to harass me in my misery? I am a friend, I answered, a once cherished friend. No friend of Helium's princess wears that medal, she replied, and yet the voice, I have heard it before. It is not, it cannot be, no, for he is dead. It is, though, my princess, none other than John Carter, I said. Do you not recognize even through the paint and strange metal the heart of your chieftain? As I came close to her, she swayed toward me with outstretched hands, but as I reached to take her in my arms, she drew back with a shudder and a little moan of misery. Too late, too late, she grieved. Oh, my chieftain that was, and whom I thought dead, had you but returned one little hour before, but now it is too late, too late. What do you mean, Deja Thoris? I cried. That you would not have promised yourself to the Zodangan prince had you known that I lived? Think you, John Carter, that I would give my heart to you yesterday and today to another? I thought that it lay buried with your ashes in the pits of Warhoon, and so today I have promised my body to another to save my people from the curse of a victorious Zodangan army. But I am not dead, my princess. I have come to claim you, and all Zodanga cannot prevent it. It is too late, John Carter. My promise is given, and on Barsoom that is final. The ceremonies which follow later are but meaningless formalities. They make the fact of a marriage no more certain than does the funeral cortege of a Jeddak again place the seal of death upon him. I am as good as married, John Carter. No longer may you call me your princess. No longer are you my chieftain. I know but little of your customs here upon Barsoom Deja Thoris, but I do know that I love you, and if you meant the last words you spoke to me that day as the hordes of Warhoon were charging down upon us, no other man shall ever claim you as bride. You meant them then, my princess, and you mean them still. Say that it is true. I meant them, John Carter, she whispered. I cannot repeat them now, for I have given myself to another. Ah, oh, if only you had known our ways, my friend. 
she continued half to herself. The promise would have been yours long months ago, and you could have claimed me before all others. It might have meant the fall of Helium, but I would have given my empire for my Tharkian chief. Then aloud she said, Do you remember the night when you offended me? You called me your princess without having asked my hand of me, and then you boasted that you had fought for me. You did not know, and I should not have been offended. I see that now. But there was no one to tell you what I could not, that upon Barsoom there are two kinds of women in the cities of the Red Men. The one they fight for also, but they never ask their hands. When a man has won a woman, he may address her as his princess, or in any of the several terms which signify possession. You had fought for me, but you had never asked me in marriage, and so when you called me your princess, you see, she faltered, I was hurt. But even then, John Carter, I did not repulse you as I should have done, until you had made it doubly worse by taunting me with having won me through combat. I do not need to ask your forgiveness now, Deja Thoris, I cried. You must know that my fault was through ignorance of your Barsoomian customs. What I failed to do through implicit belief that my petition would be presumptuous and unwelcome, I do now, Deja Thoris. I ask you to be my wife. And by all the Virginian fighting blood that flows in my veins, you shall be. No, John Carter, it is useless, she cried hopelessly. I may never be yours while Sabthon lives. You have sealed his death warrant, my princess. Sabthon dies. Not that either, she hastened to explain. I may not wed the man who slays my husband, even in self-defense. It is custom. We are ruled by custom upon Barsoom. It is useless, my friend. You must bear the sorrow with me. That, at least, we may share in common. That and the memory of the brief days among the Tharks. You must go now, nor ever see me again. Goodbye, my chieftain that was. Disheartened and dejected, I withdrew from the room. But I was not entirely discouraged, nor would I admit that Dejah Thoris was lost to me until the ceremony had actually been performed. As I wandered among the corridors, I was as absolutely lost in the mazes of winding passageways as I had been before I discovered Dejah Thoris's apartments. I knew that my only hope lay in escape from the city of Zodanga, for the matter of the four dead guardsmen would have to be explained and as I could never hope to reach my post without a guide, suspicion would surely rest on me as soon as it was discovered that I was wandering aimlessly through the palace. Presently I came upon a spiral runway leading to a lower floor, and I followed this downward for several stories until I reached the doorway of a large apartment in which were a number of guardsmen. The walls of this room were hung with transparent tapestries behind which I secreted myself without being apprehended. The conversation of the guardsmen was general and awakened no interest in me until an officer entered the room and ordered four of the men to relieve the detail who were guarding the Princess of Helium. Now I knew my troubles would commence in earnest, and indeed they were upon me all too soon, for it seemed that the squad had scarcely left the guardroom before one of their number burst in again breathlessly crying that they had found their four comrades butchered in the antechamber. In a moment the entire palace was alive with people. Guardsmen, officers, courtiers, servants, and slaves ran helter-skelter through the corridors and apartments carrying messages and orders and searching for signs of the assassin. This was my opportunity, and slim as it appeared, I grabbed for it, for as a number of soldiers came hurrying past my hiding place, I fell in behind them and followed through the mazes of the palace until, in passing through a great hall, I saw the blessed light of day coming in through a series of large windows. Here I left my guides, and slipping to the nearest window, sought for an avenue of escape. The windows opened upon a great balcony which overlooked one of the broad avenues of Zodanga. The ground was about thirty feet below, and at a like distance from the building was a wall fully twenty feet high, constructed of a polished glass about a foot in thickness. To a red Martian escape by this path would have appeared impossible, but to me with my earthly strength and agility it seemed already accomplished. My only fear was in being detected before darkness fell, for I could not make the leap in broad daylight while the court below and the avenue beyond were crowded with Zodangans. Accordingly, I searched for a hiding place and finally found one by accident inside a huge hanging ornament which hung from the ceiling of the hall, at about ten feet from the floor. Into the capacious, bowl-like vase I sprang with ease, and scarcely had I settled down within it than I heard a number of people enter the apartment. The group stopped beneath my hiding place, and I could plainly overhear their every word. It is the work of Heliumites, said one of the men. 
Yes, O Jeddak, but how have they access to the palace? I could believe that even with the diligent care of your guardsmen, a single enemy might reach the inner chambers, but how a force of six or eight fighting men could have done so unobserved is beyond me. We shall know, however, soon, for here comes the royal psychologist. Another man now joined the group, and after making his formal greetings to his ruler, said, O oh, mighty Jeddak, it is a strange tale I read in the dead minds of your faithful guardsmen. They were felled not by a number of fighting men, but by a single opponent. He paused to let the full weight of this announcement impress his hearers, and that his statement was scarcely credited was evidenced by the impatient exclamation of incredulity which escaped the lips of Than Kosis. What manner of weird tale are you bringing me, Notan? he cried. It is the truth, my Jeddak, replied the psychologist. In fact, the impressions were strongly marked in the brain on each of the four guardsmen. Their antagonist was a very tall man wearing the medal of one of your own guardsmen, and his fighting ability was little short of marvelous, for he fought fair against the entire four and vanquished them by his surpassing skill and superhuman strength and endurance. Though he wore the medal of Zodanga, my Jadok, such a man was never seen before in this or any other country upon Barsoom. The mind of the Princess of Helium, whom I have examined and questioned, was a blank to me, as she has perfect control, and I could not read one iota of it. She said she witnessed a portion of the encounter, and that when she looked there was but one man engaged with the guardsman, a man whom she did not recognize as ever having seen. "'Where is my erstwhile savior? spoke another of the party, and I recognized the voice of the cousin of Thon Kosis, whom I had rescued from the Green Warriors. "'By the medal of my first ancestor,' he went on. "'But the description fits him to perfection, especially as to his fighting ability.' "'Where is this man?' cried Thon Kosis. "'Have him brought to me at once. What know you of him, cousin?' It seemed strange to me that I think upon it now that there should have been such a fighting man in Zodanga, of whose name even we were ignorant before today. And his name, too, John Carter, who ever heard of such a name? Word was soon brought that I was nowhere to be found, either in the palace or in my former quarters in the barracks of the Air Scout Squadron. Kantos Khan they had found and questioned, but he knew nothing of my whereabouts, and as to my past, he had told them that he knew as little, since he had but recently met me during our captivity among the war hoons. Keep your eyes upon this one, commanded Thon Kosis. He also is a stranger, and likely as not, they both hail from helium, and where one is, we shall sooner or later find the other. Quadruple the air patrol, and let every man who leaves the city by air or ground be subjected to the closest scrutiny. Another messenger now entered with word that I was still within the palace walls. The likeness of every person who has entered or left the palace ground today has been carefully examined, concluded the fellow, and not one approaches the likeness of this new padoir of the guards other than that which was recorded of him at the time he entered. Then we will have him shortly, commented Thon Kosis contentedly, and in the meantime we will repair to the apartments of the Princess of Helium and question her in regard to the affair. She may know more than she cared to divulge to you, Notan. Come. They left the hall, and as darkness had fallen without, I slipped lightly from my hiding place and hastened to the balcony. Few were in sight, and choosing a moment when none seemed near, I sprang quickly to the top of the glass wall, and from there to the avenue beyond the palace grounds. That's the end of today's reading. We'll continue tomorrow with the next chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Text copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This reading copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John of the Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds. More information about this project and about the library is at von-junst.org. V-O-N-J-U-N-Z-T. Good night, and I wish...